Hello, entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Laura L. Bernhard. Welcome back to the Marketing Bound Podcast, where we help you leverage inbound marketing strategies to grow your business. This week, I interview Antonio Patrick Buchanan, co-CEO and chief strategy officer of the global brand innovation and design firm, Antonio in Paris. He's worked with American Express, Citigroup, Verizon, P&G, and Disney, just to name a few companies. In what you're about to hear, Antonio describes the difference between marketing and branding. He explains the importance of customer experience in every business. He mentions the emotional drivers that make us fall in love with certain brands. And Antonio also reveals a branding framework that you can use to develop your own brand. Antonio provides actionable guidance that you can implement in your brand right away. So make sure to listen until the very end of the episode. Then be sure to subscribe to the Marketing Bound podcast and share this episode. Hi, Antonio. Thank you so much for being on the Marketing Bound podcast. Hey, Laura, how are you? I'm super great. I'm super excited to get into this. And I just want to dive in with, I know that some of your greatest accomplishments is your family, your grandkids, selling an agency. But I think the question on our mind is, what is your favorite campaign that you've ever worked on? (laughs) Huh. Um, I think my favorite campaign that I've ever worked on was the, uh, I was privileged to work on Gatorade on the Be Like Mike um, campaign, so with Michael Jordan. And so uh, that, was, that was a great experience going through that. Um, mm. It was uh, fun seeing how he interacted with the crew and everything else. And that campaign actually became kind of this icon in sports marketing. And so uh, the other day I was watching on uh, HBO or something, they had the Michael Jordan documentary and they actually started talking about that experience and I started having flashbacks. So it was, it was cool. Oh, that must've been such a nice moment. Like a little, yeah. little tear, a little like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Another thing I know is that you deal with a lot of customers, big companies, small companies, startups, a wide range of different target audiences, which is amazing. But a question that you keep getting is what is the difference between branding and marketing? Ah, okay. So can you give us a little definition of both? Yeah, how they yeah. intertwine? Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, marketing, I'll start with the, the, the easier one. The, the marketing is all of the pieces that you do to be able to reach out to a consumer, uh, whether it's through social media, whether it's from uh, digital aspect, traditional advertising, things like that, PR, Branding is completely different. Branding is, uh, you're, you're kind of getting at the soul of what a company is and what that relationship is with the consumer. And so it's every single touch point that, that you can imagine from the time that they walk through a store and they pick up your packaging and they touch and they feel it to, you know that moment when you walk into a hotel or to a spa and you can, there's that smell that you get, that aroma that you get, that's unique to that place, that every time you go back now, you, you remember that aroma. All of that kind of falls into branding. It's the, all the individual pieces um, that tell a story for what that company is and how they relate to the consumer. It's, that reminds me of uh, Amber Crombie and Finch. You know, you go, yeah. you walk in and there's like the models. So you have like the mm-hmm. visual cue. Mm-hmm. And then and then you have the smell of just like a lot of perfume. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So got that kind of vibe. And that's, that's what brings everything together. Exactly. The, the more you can bring in the five senses, uh, mm-hmm. the better off that you are in that relationship. Because you're giving people a lot of the different cues that they could have to recognize the brand right away, whether it's to your point, that that visual cue or whether it's going to be uh, that taste or that smell or that touch, whatever it is, it has to be something that there's this immediate thought process that you get this feeling of um, comfort, this feeling of excitement, this feeling of um, there's something I'm going to get out of this that's going to be spectacular. And so 
those things kind of give you the cue. I'm about to go through something that's going to be pretty cool. That point that you just mentioned is it really dives into well with what you believe in and that it's igniting the love affair between brands and consumers. And I think that's super important because you bring up the consumers and you're always talking about the experience for the target audience and in branding and marketing as a whole, I feel like a lot of people forget (laughs) for, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they kind of, they, yeah, they kind of forget like, Oh, I'm doing this for another human. I have to consider that other human. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. So tell me, <laughs> tell me a little bit more about why that phrase is so important to you and how you make it part of your company. Yeah, um, you know, we um, uh, do a lot of work, to your point, with large companies, smaller companies, and it's funny, the, the, the challenges are pretty much the same. It's, it's kind of the budgets might be different, whether you're small versus large, but the challenges are pretty much the same. And ironically, a lot of times, even in the larger companies, they forget about the consumer and and what it is they kind of let's build this product and let's try to get it to that consumer as quickly as possible and i keep saying to people you know it's almost like if you're going to go on a date you're not going to ask the person to marry you within three minutes of the date you know like i'd love to have a glass of wine and by the way will you marry me so (laughs) there's this thing that you have to do you you kind of have to court them you you kind of have to have some interest there you kind of have to find out what are the things that they're that they love, that they hate, and all of that, you kind of have to go through it. My wife has this this thing that she says, her dad used to say when she was growing up to boys, you need to date her and you need to go through all four seasons before you have the right to ask her to marry marry you. And and it's that, right? You need to go through the four seasons so you understand how how that is gonna work. But I think one of the things that we think is important in our company is it's not just connecting, and we are very specific in when we thought about this, it's not just connecting brands to consumers. It's there needs to be a love of it. If it's gonna work, if it's gonna be something where it's gonna be long lasting, right? It's not gonna be just this uh, one minute transaction and then you go away and then you have to start all over again from scratch. It's a lot easier if you find out the information about the target, if you kind of live their lives, put yourselves in in their shoes um, and understand emotionally, what are the things that you're giving to that customer, not just practically, but emotionally too. When they they purchase your product, what do you want to make them feel? What's that emotional payoff that they're going to get? Because that's what's going to make them keep coming back over and over again. That's what's going to make them love you. And if they love you, then game over then you know they're they're going to be more receptive to you making mistakes which you will as a marketer you're going to make mistakes but it's okay because it's going to be this acceptance because they love you and so to get to that point though you need to earn it you have to be there you have to learn about them you have to ask the right questions sometimes it's not about asking the questions sometimes you just sit and observe Uh, and we do that a lot we spend a lot of time sitting and observing uh, customers, not just going into a focus group or taking a survey, but we send our teams out into the marketplace to find out, just sit, take notes, take pictures of interesting things that you see people doing, and then bring that back and we'll figure out how to put that into the brand. Okay, we have to unpack a lot in there, so. (laughs) (laughs) I apologize, I get really excited about those things. No, it it was great because it was like full circle, but let's, let's dive in deeper into a few points. So one of the things you said was that no matter who you're helping, there are similar challenges that come up. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example of maybe the overarching exam uh, challenge that keeps coming up, no matter how big the company is? Sure. Um, Digital, you know, particularly with with what's gone on now with COVID, a lot of brands that may not have been digital first want to be digital first. Um, They don't have an option, right? So they want to jump into it. I think they forget, though, both large and small. And it's funny, smaller, smaller companies actually sometimes get it faster than the larger companies. Um, They forget that 
And whether it's a traditional relationship you're having or a digital relationship you're having, you still need to understand who these people are. So there's some data points that, that we're gonna need from a quantitative perspective that we're mm -hmm. going to need to, to get to. Um, and many a time the challenges are, I need to do it tomorrow. And so how quickly can we get to market? Uh, we need to sell as much as possible now without taking the time to understand the consumer first. Mm -hmm. So one challenge that we face when we talk to customers a lot of times is that they want to jump out and do a lot of performance marketing uh, activity right away. And it's, it's, it's interesting because they haven't nailed what the, the right message should be. They haven't understood what um, the, the key cues are uh, in the communication that they should have. So we have to kind of pull them back and go, wait a minute, you're going to waste a lot of money because you haven't taken the time to figure that out. So why would you go into the marketplace with a lot of different messages that you have no idea if it's going to work or not versus taking the time up front to do that? So I think that's one of the challenges uh, that we see both big and small is not having the time uh, to be able to take that first step, which is to us one of the most important steps in the relationship is getting the message right before you go to market. Oh, super important. Yeah. Especially if you want that love affair that you're talking about before. Exactly. How exactly. are you gonna, how is that performance marketing going to perform if you don't have the foundation? Right. Right. Right, correct. Right. So I'm out of curiosity. I know you've worked with a lot of big companies, um, but in your experience, other than like Apple and Nike and like those big companies, um, is there a brand that you're like, oh, they're doing it so well. Yeah, there's a new there's a new company that just launched actually mm -hmm. within the last week or so, a couple of weeks ago, um, and it's called Bobby. Okay. Um, and you know how I know I, I know they're doing it well because I can't help them right now. They're doing it so well that I can't help them. And um, from a branding perspective, it's a it's a new uh, infant formula created by two moms um, and um, they're taking a European approach to the formula. So uh, everything is organic in the formula. I mean, they've gone painstakingly using the European standards for formula, which is a lot stricter than in the United States, uh, even though they're a US company. And when you go to their site, it, you, you understand the essence of the brand. It feels like two moms. Um, mm -hmm really created this, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a kind of home, homey way, but it's more like they understand as a mom the things that you would be looking for when you come to their website. Mm -hmm. um, they understand what the questions that you're gonna ask uh, before you even ask the questions. And so they've done their homework uh, in terms of understanding that consumer really mm -hmm. well. Uh, so that's one of the brands that I've looked at over the last, I've, I've watched them get ready to launch, and I've seen the launch and um, they've done a great job. And I love that you brought back, brought back the consumer again. Like the example that you just gave, you could have said, I don't know, let's say we, you were gonna mention Nike, like, oh, they have great ads. Oh, they really make you feel something in their ads. But your example was very much how they understood their, con their consumer base. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's something to say about really understanding your target audience. So now I kind of want to bring it back to entrepreneurs and startups and smaller companies. Okay. So as a small company, if you're one person or a really, really small team, how are you going to go out and do all this data? Cause you mentioned observation. Um, how are you going to do that if you're one person and you still have to sell on one side, but then, okay, now I might have a digital product to sell. How do I incorporate that into the business? You know, it's interesting. A lot of people, um, they understand, like, if, if I want to go out right now and find, um, I'm a, I, I happen to be a tennis uh, fanatic. Mm -hmm. If I want to find the latest tennis racket, I know how to go and Google it and do my research and things like that. For some reason, when you become an entrepreneur, you forget that you can do that, right? Like, 
I, I don't know. It, it also all of a sudden becomes complicated uh, where it doesn't need to be. And so I think the internet is the first place you go to. I mean, mm -hmm. go and Google uh, things about your consumer, things about somebody that might be interested in your product. Uh, mm -hmm. Start with yourself, for instance. You started this company for a reason. There's a service that you're bringing, there's a product that you're bringing to the table. Why are you passionate about that? You want more people like you. And mm -hmm. so think about that. Then go out and there's so much second and third party research that's out there right now. Um, that if you can't afford to, it's okay if you can't afford to throw down a lot of money in consumer research and, and first party data and things like that. You have the ability to get the second and third party data. You also have the ability to, let's use the example of Bobby again with the, with the, uh, with the, um, the two women that started that. You have the ability to put yourself, go to mommy, go to a mommy and me class. Just mm -hmm. sit. Watch the way that the, that the people interact with their children. Watch what they're doing with the formula when it's time to feed them. Um, just sit and watch. Maybe you'll ask a couple of questions there as well. But there's a lot of inexpensive ways. It's no excuse to go, I don't have the money, because you don't need the money to be able to do it. It's, it's more of your time than it's going to be of uh, a financial burden on you. It's going to be a time burden on you. But that time is some valuable time that you can put into really understanding your customer. We worked on um, a small division. It's a, it was a big company, Newell Rubbermaid, but it's one of their smallest divisions um, that deal with blades, um, saw blades for construction sites um, that I wouldn't even have thought about working on a project like that before because I didn't even know these things existed. We spent a lot of time in just our team walking the aisles of Home Depot and Lowe's. We actually walked around construction sites and talked to, just rolled up while we were having coffee and started asking them, why do you use that blade? Why don't you use the other blade? Things like that. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised at how much people are willing to give you information because you're asking them questions about things that they're interested in. They want to talk to you about that. Yeah, it's like the one you mentioned when you go out on a date with somebody. If you're asking the right questions, they will be interested, but only after four seasons, then you can get married. There you go. <laughs> We're all learning here. <laughs> but I, I want to... Although I, wanna... I did propose after two seasons, so I guess I didn't listen. I didn't you listen didn't listen, her. but you didn't know because it was from her dad, right? I, I didn't know, but you, you didn't know, know. It's all these four kids and two grandkids later, so it's all good. <laughs> It still worked out. It still worked out. That's right. But to bring this home for everybody who's listening that might be a service-based entrepreneur, mm -hmm. um, I think that is a really good point for them. Like there's no reason why you cannot do research about your target audience. Yeah. First, knowing what your message is, who you're targeting. And then let's say you have a digital product, really understanding the need for that digital product before putting it out there. And, and the journey. Because depending on, let's say you're, you're, you're brick and mortar and now you're going to go digital. Mm -hmm. Don't assume that that journey is the same journey. You know, right now I want to go out and I want to purchase something. I kind of know, okay, I kind of know which stores that I want to go to that I can get XYZ product. Mm -hmm. It may be from a digital perspective that it's different. I may want to go do research first on the product. I may go to the site first. I might find other competitors and I'm going to come back again. There's a lot of back and forth because it's so easy to do. It takes very little out of me. I'm not getting into a car. I'm not walking into a store. All I have to do is sit on my laptop or my mobile device and I can basically find anything I need to make the decision for the purchase. Mm -hmm. So the funnel, the, the traditional funnel that we're so used to talking about doesn't really exist anymore because from a digital perspective, at every point of contact, I still need to make sure that I make you aware. I still need to make sure there's a consideration set. I still need to go for the sale. And because I don't know where you are in that funnel process from a digital perspective, I need to give all those elements quickly. So we're, we're going to get back to the, to the dating thing again. It's like speed dating. Like mm -hmm. people need to know as much as possible as quickly as possible. 
Yeah. I like that analogy of speed dating because you have to be aware, likeness, and then purchase in those five minutes. Those like five if you minutes. have if you have a landing page, a splash page, you have to make sure all those components are on that page. Exactly. That's the only way you're going to be converting people, especially as a small business, as an entrepreneur, right? right? So I'm thinking, well, not that I'm thinking. I remembered a stat that I heard from a marketer saying that you have to have so many touch points before you can sell something to somebody. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you what she said, but in your expert opinion, (laughs) how many touch points do you think there needs to be before somebody makes a purchase? I believe that it's somewhere between four and five. Well, here's the thing. Do you want them to make a one-time purchase or do you want them to, to keep coming back? Because there's a difference between those two. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if I need you, if I want you to come back, mm-hmm. I'll go that extra mile. I'll add a couple of touch points in there because, again, I'm trying to get you to fall in love with me. And I'm not going to be able to do that um, without differentiating myself. Mm-hmm. I had a conversation last night, literally last night, uh, with a client. And we were talking about, he was talking about his brand. And he said, his brand, his differentiator was e-commerce. And so that was what his brand stood for. By the way, it's, it's an extremely large company in Europe. Okay. Right? So, um, and I was talking to the CEO and I said, you're wrong. That's not your differentiator because it's too easy to copy. Yeah. Even, even with the technology, if you have best in class technology today, I can copy that and do it again tomorrow. And then now you're at this commodity phase that you're just at. Where's the emotional intersection with that? Mm -hmm. Where's the thing that's going to make someone go, wow, it's a tie between whether I'm going to use company A or company B, but I have feelings for this other company. And that's the reason why I'm going to go in that direction. And so if you want to do that, yes, you can make that sale in less um, clicks, However, you might not want to. You might want to wait a little, just a little. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, wait from a week to wait to three months from now, but give it a couple of extra ones because you're giving them the opportunity to know who you are. As an entrepreneur, too, I would argue, um, and it's taken me a long time to understand this. Think about it. I'm an entrepreneur, right? I'm I'm not one of these big uh, Fortune 100 companies. And it's taken me a long time for for me to understand as an entrepreneur, you are your company. No one can sell your company better than you are. So they're also buying you, what you believe, what you stand for, what the values are that you have as well. Um, And so when, when, don't be afraid to to really put out there what you stand for and who you are, because they're going to be purchasing that along with what else you're selling. And that's part of your brand. That's part of your brand. That's part, now, especially if you're the brand is the company. No, the brand is the company and you. And mm-hmm. and since you're the person that represents as a small business entrepreneur, they're looking at you. They're purchasing you as well. Mm-hmm. For anyone who's curious, um, the woman that I was referring to before, she said that you had to have a, a minimum of twelve touch points. Mm-hmm. Which I guess makes sense with what you said as well, because you want them to have a long customer lifetime value. Right. Right. I'm going to get you to purchase more and more often. Exactly. Right. So you, you were talking a lot about emotions and making sure that there's that love affair. What are some emotional drivers that make someone fall in love with a brand? Okay. So we, when we're building a brand for a client, big or small, uh, we have what we call these need scopes that we look at. And we try to define what's the need scope that we're delivering on. And it can be anything from when I purchase this product, does it make me look smart? That's one of the emotions. Mm -hmm. When I purchase this product, do I get status out of it? Does it make me feel as if I'm affiliated with a group now? When I purchase this product, is there a release factor that I have? It's been a bad day and I just need to go wild and it's going to make me feel really good, right? So there's that. Does it make me feel like I'm more independent? Mm -hmm. Um, And so there are these factors that we have in there 
that we look at that what's the thing that the brand is emotionally, not just the product that you're giving them, but what are you emotionally giving them that person? What's the emotional currency that you're, that you're giving to that individual? Because if you can't identify that, we have a problem. And so uh, those are kind of the ones that we really hone in on and look at. Ooh, that's super important. It's not just your service or your product. Emotionally, what are you giving your audience, right. your target audience? And I think that's a really good point to hammer home. Another question I had for you in terms of entrepreneurs. So a lot of entrepreneurs are like, oh, you know, like, they might not know a lot about marketing, so they kind of ignore the branding part. They're missing out on, do you think they're missing out on an emotional connection with their audience if they don't build a brand? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think not only do you need to know, you asked about the emotional drivers, mm -hmm. but then they need to know um, what's the archetype that I'm fulfilling. So what am I, what am I going to, What's the role that I'm playing to, de to deliver this, right? Mm -hmm. So um, am I going to be, uh, am I going to do it in a humorous way? Am I going to do it in a caretaker way that, I, that I'm going to be caring and nurturing way? Um, if I'm going after a business audience, do I need to do that in a more um, CEO executive way? Because that's going to be the voice that your brand is going to use to articulate what it is. So for instance, if I'm going to, if your emotional delivery that you're giving to someone is, um, let's say it's release. So I'm going to go crazy. This product is going to make me do that. But I'm going to, it makes no sense if I deliver that as an executive. No one's going to buy that. That's not the voice that I should use an executive to sell. Let's go out and get crazy. Mm -hmm. So you have to match those two things up. And that's when you need to understand what's the tone and voice of your company. What, what's that feeling? What's that persona? If you had to look at your company and draw a picture of it, what would it look like? Mm -hmm. That's what's going to deliver those messages to the consumer. I like the idea of drawing it out. But if you don't mind, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have an idea. Okay. If I give you an example of an entrepreneur and a service that he or she offers, can we go through this process that you just went to? Sure. Like what kind of emotional drivers and how we can connect that to the archetype? Let's do it. Okay. Woo. So let's say someone is listening and they're a leadership coach. Okay. Oh, let's say it's um, one that helps other women. You know, there's a lot of women helping other women being leaders, right? Okay. So what are the emotional drivers? of that brand? For me, I'm looking at two things in the very beginning. Okay. This is without doing research, but there's mm. two things come top of mind. One is discernment. So that's that smart decision-making. I'm a smart individual for, for signing up for this coaching, things like that. The other is affiliation. Um, I want to feel like I'm part of a group as well. So when I take those two things, they ladder up to a message for me, right? I'm going to have to, whatever message I have needs to tick the box for, I look smart for doing this. This is going to make me even smarter. And at the same time, it makes me feel good that I'm affiliated with other women who are smart and are doing this too. There's so networking opportunities and things like that. So we'll, we'll look to find the intersection in the message between those two things. Okay. So just before we move on, I just want to reiterate you determined the, the two emotional drivers and then you created a message from it. Correct. Okay, what's the next step? Then I go, how am I gonna say this? So I've identified what the message is, but what's the voice I'm gonna use? Am I gonna be funny? Am I gonna be witty? Am I gonna be uh, more professional than anything? Am I gonna be nurturing? And so I think there, there's a couple of things. One is you need to think about who that entrepreneur is because their brand, it, you can't fake it. So a lot of people go, you know, I'm a very conservative person, I'm a very professional person, but I'm gonna try to be witty and funny in, in, in my communications. It's not gonna work. So you need to be as authentic as possible because people can see that a mile away if you do that. That's where your values um, come in. 
So, exactly. so at this third at this third step that we're talking about, the voice, make sure that you're including your own values because that is inevitably inevitably part of your brand. <laughs> authenticity is key. Yeah. I mean, that's where street cred comes from, your <laughs> authenticity, right? So let's not get it twisted. Authenticity is 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 keeping it real. Mm -hmm. Um and think about it for a second. The, the, the people that we're attracted to in whatever it is, whether it's in uh, acting or music or business or things like that, the people that kind of rise to the top, whether you like them or not, the thing that stands out with a lot of them is the authenticity. They are who they are and they don't make apologies for it. Be mm -hmm. who you are and you'll get the people that you, people like you will join the club. I think the best example is Kim Kardashian. It is. It she really is. is. And you know, I, people, a lot of people talk to me about, what do you think about, because of the Kim and Kanye thing, you know, you can't go a couple of days without talking about them. But what do you think about Kim and Kanye? And isn't he crazy and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, he's one of the most creative people I know. Forgetting about the problems that he may have. Mm -hmm. He is one of the, and he keeps it real. It's what he believes in. And it's what drives his creativity, more power to him. And so I think you need to own that um, because that's where your creativity is going to come from, from your authenticity. And that's when people are going to go, okay, well, I have this line of people with white button down shirts. All nine guys have white button down shirts. And then the next thing I know, I see the guy with the pink shirt. Who am I going to pay attention to? I'm going to pay attention to the guy with the pink shirt. And so don't be ashamed of it, own it. Yeah, great message. So is there another step after the voice that we should be telling the audience about? Yeah, I think, you know, the thing, the audience wants to know about you is well, what's your story? Mm -hmm. Where did you come from? Why did you start this company in the first place? Um, what made you passionate about it as well? So the message is fine. And yes, you should think about it from a marketing perspective, but more importantly, think about it from a storytelling perspective. Every time you go out with a message, that should be an extension of your storyline. Because people buy stories. They don't buy taglines. They don't buy headlines. They don't buy marketing campaigns. They buy stories. And the more that you can do that, every single time you go to them, you build on your story, the better off you're better off you are. REI does it very well. Um, uh, Bobby, who I just talked about, they do it well. Um, I send notes probably, I don't know, twice a month, three times a month to clients that are not mine who are doing phenomenal work just to go, oh my God, just saw your campaign. This is the greatest thing on the planet. Um, I sent a note actually a few months ago to the head of marketing for Marriott. You know, they launched the Marriott Bonvoy. And if you look at their, uh, which is their rewards program, and I happened to be in a hotel room, one of their hotels on a business trip, this is pre-COVID. And I turned the television on and you know, all hotels have their, yeah. their channel, right? Yeah. And, but in this one, there were these stories. And there were these stories about individuals who um, were doing the coolest things ever. One was about a dancer. One was about this person that um, is trying to be a free diver and go as deep as possible. Another was about Aloe Black, the, the singer, right? So there's all of that. At no time did they say, come visit Marriott. In all of these stories, it was never mentioned. It was mm -hmm. about destinations. It was about the life that you can live when you travel. And it was almost that Nike effect. If you've noticed with Nike, they never say, buy our shoe, ever. They mm -hmm. don't say, we have the best shoe on the market. What they do say in their communications is, we understand athletes better than anybody else. And then you go, wow, well, if they understand athletes better than everybody else, then they must understand how to build a great shoe. Mm -hmm. You give them credit for something that they didn't even tell you. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Marriott, they get, you gave them credit you understand travelers. You get what I get out of traveling. So you must know how to take care of me when I'm in your hotel. Tell a story. And that's the fourth and final part. Correct. 
That's amazing. Um, and then ask her to marry you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there are so many things I want to ask you about. Um, where to go next? I think let's tap into the differentiator that you mentioned before. You know, you were talking to the CEO yesterday. He said he's an e-commerce and you're like, no, that's not a good enough differentiator. So now that we went through messaging and really honing into a brand to help us differentiate our products and services, can branding alone be a differentiator for an entrepreneur? No. Well, let me back up for a second. Okay. I consider everything branding. So in, in our company, for instance, we do research, we do positioning, we do design, things like that. Um, one of the things that we say to all of our clients is it's more than those things. Branding is, um, for instance, there's a, a healthcare company uh, that we work with, Brookdale Senior Living. They're the largest in the United States. We did a brand overhaul for them as well. And they, they were good enough when we came back to them and said, okay, now that we've done this part, now it's time to move on to the next part, which is um, when someone answers your phone and say, good morning, this is Brookdale, can we listen to it and see how that sounds? Because that's part of your brand too. The way they yeah. answer your phone is part of the brand. The way they deal with accounts receivable or accounts payable is part of your brand. It's mm -hmm. every single touch point. So there's an operations part of it, of the equation too. And too often what happens is people look at the brand as those pretty cute, you know, fun things to do. And they don't take it through all the way to the end. Like what happens at the cashier? What happens or, or when I'm checking out from a digital perspective? Mm -hmm. What message did I get back after uh, someone's purchased a product from me? Mm -hmm. um, if, if it's sold out or if, if there's something that's wrong, how do they handle that? All of that is part of branding too. Every um, interaction. But it's operational, but I call yeah. that branding too. Every interaction. Yeah. yeah, of course. That makes sense. And a good example that popped into mind is just like Disney World. Mm -hmm. So no matter what happens to you at Disney World, it'll always be branded like Disney. It is. Every part of it. So it is. Yeah. And so they do it in a way that, uh, I'll be honest, I'm a marketer. I've been doing this for years. I took my grandson to Disney World for the first time, six years old. I take him to Disney. So I'm kind of hip to, okay, you're just trying to get this from me. You're just trying to get that from me. We walk in and one of their, they call them their, their, their cast members, walks over to us and my grandson's talking to him and my grandson says, it's my birthday. And they go, oh, it's your birthday. Then you need to walk into any one of these stores and you need to pick out a button that'll say it's your birthday because Cristobal, we want you to be special today. And so he's like, can we go get, <clears throat> excuse me, can we go get my, my button? And I go, sure. So we walk in and we get a button and the person says, is this your first time at Disney? He goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, then you get a button for that too. And, and so now he has three buttons on. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's really cute. I didn't think about the fact that for the rest of the day, as he walked through the park, characters were walking up and saying, happy birthday, Cristobal. Oh, it's your first time? Are you having a good time? The interaction that took place because of those cues mm -hmm. was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. and yet still and that and that's not an ad it's not any of that that's just connecting on a constant basis at different opportunities um and so yeah they fooled me they got me with that one i was impressed <laughs> that's that's the operations that you were talking that's about. the operations that it's you're very much that client um it was his birthday. Right. They made sure that his first time was very, very special. That so he keeps asking you to go back over and exactly. over and over again. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah, they do it. They do it so well. I remember it's that. Flawless. It really is. That happened to my sister too when we were younger. And they, she had like the pin. Yeah. And then they would get get her into the parades and it yeah. Was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was super, super cool. So. I think we can talk for hours about branding. <laughs> I'm realizing that now as I have a list of more questions for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm talking too much. I'm sorry. No. I get excited about it. You're not talking too much. You're giving us 
great tips and advice on how to build our brands to be even better. Um, but I think you're going to have to come back. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You and I, I mean, we, we've connected from the first time we ever spoke. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for today, before, before we leave, I'm going to ask you a couple more questions, but then you're going to sure. have to come back. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So before, before uh, you leave, is there something that you want to leave with the listeners that we haven't already talked about? Yeah. Um, two things. One is purpose. Um, it's really important that you understand why you wake up in the morning. What's the thing that you're delivering to the world? Um, what's the thing that makes you get out of bed? What's the thing that gets you, gets you so excited that you get your team stoked when you go in? And I don't care if it's a thousand member team or a two member team, you need to make sure that they're really stoked about what you're doing. And you need to stop and think about why do I exist? Why does this product exist? Why does this brand exist? And keep going back to that. Uh, because that's going to help you with decision making later on. Um, it'll make decisions. A lot of times, a lot of problems that people have is they get stuck. They get so many different options as an entrepreneur. Of, I can go in Avenue A, B, or C, and they can't figure out which way it is. Define what your purpose is and hold every decision up against that purpose. Um, every decision you make with your brand, hold it up against that purpose and go, am I validating this purpose? Am I pushing this purpose further? Things like that. It will make life much easier in the decision-making process and what you're doing. Um, I think the other one is don't be afraid to be as creative as possible. Um, try everything. Um, it's okay if it doesn't work because you still learn something from that. And so creativity is just this wonderful thing. You know, it's this, this thing that a lot of people think that some of us are born with and some of us are not, which is quite honestly BS. But we all have creativity in us. It's the, do I have the nerve and the courage to kind of go out there and put myself out there? That's the only difference is there's some people that have the courage to do it and other people that are extremely creative that don't. And so harness that creativity and go do what you need to do because you'll, you'll be surprised at what happens. Creativity and purpose, everyone. Yes. So tell everybody where they can find you and how they can work with you. Sure. Uh, the name of the company is AntonioInParis.com. Uh, I'm the chief strategy officer and CEO, and Paris is the chief creative officer, co-CEO. Um, yes, we are married. Um, and um, you can find us at uh, AntonioInParis.com, uh, or you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at um, APB Moxie uh, is the handle that you can do there. So there you go. That's where you can find us. I'll link it all in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Antonio. This is awesome. I want to do this again with you. Even, let's talk about something else. I don't know. I'm <laughs> <laughs> we stop this one. We continue. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs>